This is an audio rendition of Dave Roberson's book, The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power, Chapter 7, as read by Keith Davis. There is a prophetic message at the beginning of each chapter, and this one is, Offer yourselves a living sacrifice through the eternal Spirit, saith the Spirit of grace. For I do desire even this day that you be not conformed to the world and its systems, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will that I have separated you unto from the foundations of the earth. Oh, that you might enter into the delicacies of the Spirit, that precious place of fellowship with me, that dormitory of understanding where I invite you in to fellowship with me, where things are seen through the eyes of the Spirit, and your understanding is charged with my understanding. And I would say unto you that in this secret place of the Most High dwells the understanding and the power for your transformation. Therefore, pray and utilize the forces and the power of the Spirit within, and pray, edifying yourself, that you may enter in. Chapter 7 Praying Out the Mysteries of God's Plan What if you had a prayer partner, someone who was your friend, who was so knowledgeable of God that he never prayed amiss? What if he always knew the beginning from the end and knew God's will for you in every circumstance? What if this prayer partner spoke with such wisdom that he was always one step ahead of the devil and never prayed in unbelief because he knew the mind of God so thoroughly? What if he knew what God has called you to do in minute detail and never, ever in the history of all creation had one of his prayers fail? Would you like someone like that praying for you? And if you had someone like that, how much would you let him pray for you? Three minutes a day? Or as much as he wanted to? Well, you can have just such a prayer partner. Just open your mouth and say, Hello, Holy Ghost. Finding God's perfect will for you. Every time you spend an hour or a day praying in tongues, you are praying out the mind of Christ that encompasses the full foundational revelation of the church. The mystery of everything that Christ the hope of glory is in you, to you, and through you. But as you continue to pray out those mysteries, the Holy Spirit also expresses the mind of Christ for you on a very personal level, helping you find and walk in the absolute perfect plan of God for your life. That's one of the Holy Spirit's most crucial roles in your life. Why? Well, are you sure that you know exactly what your calling is in the body of Christ? Did you know that you can flounder around all of your life under the ceiling of the flesh and never find God's perfect will for you? For instance, if you stop along the way to fight with people, you will go no further than fight until you deal with it according to the word. That's why the Bible says there is a good and an acceptable and a perfect will of God for your life. Romans 12, 2. Jesus also talked about different types of ground in people's hearts. One type yields 30-fold, one 60-fold, and another 100-fold of the word that is sown. Mark 4, 20. Many people never leave the 30-fold stage of their God's plan for them. They spend their entire lives cheated out of their reward because they don't know how to release the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. If they understood how to do that, then every day would bring them closer to God's perfect plan. Next year will be different than this year, and five years down the road they'd be able to look back and know that they hadn't wasted that time. I went on a personal search to discover from the Word of God not only how to find the perfect will of God for my life, but how to go on by the power of the Holy Spirit to pursue it. I found my answer in the book of Romans. 
And now there isn't a thing this side of hell that the devil can do to stop me. Because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4 The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Let's look at what Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2 about the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. These verses say that somehow, through the offering of my body as a living sacrifice, I will go through a process that causes me to no longer be conformed to this world, its way of thinking, and what it does. Somehow I will experience transformation, transformation by the renewing of my mind to prove not only the good, but the acceptable, and finally the absolute perfect will of God. So my question to God was this, what perfect will are you talking about? I mean, if I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice and as a result find your perfect will, I'd like to know what perfect will I'm looking for. I went to someone known to be knowledgeable of the scriptures and asked him, what perfect will of God is the Bible talking about in Romans 12, 2? He asked me, What is your spiritual background, Brother Roberson? Oh, my background is ultra-holiness. We believed that it was a sin to wear jewelry and that women shouldn't cut their hair. We had a lot of legalistic do's and don'ts because we thought that pleased God. We also thought God sent disease to teach us lessons and gave us poverty to keep us humble. Well, do you still believe that way? No, I replied. I believe that Jesus Christ bore my sicknesses and carried my pains, and I don't have to be sick anymore. It would be a miscarriage of justice for God to put a disease on me when he already laid it on Jesus, and I believe it is his good pleasure to bless me materially and financially, not to keep me broke. The man said, that's right. You see, you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind as you learn more of God's Word. You're finding the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. My friend's explanation is in part what that verse is saying. But later I found out that when verse 2 isn't taken out of context, it is easier to see exactly what it's talking about. The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God refers to your call in the body of Christ that God has given you by grace. And if you ever learn to offer your body as a living sacrifice, you will find not just the good, not just the acceptable, but the absolute perfect will of God for your life. Prove that to me, Brother Roberson. I'll be glad to. Let's look at Romans 12, 4-8. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Within this many-membered spiritual body called the body of Christ are many graces and callings that differ one from another, whether they be apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist, helps, governments, or the diversities of tongues. So this passage of scripture, taken in context, 
is saying that if I ever learn how to offer my body as a living sacrifice, the result will be that I find God's particular grace and calling for my life. How do we offer our bodies as living sacrifices? The reason some people don't experience many faith victories in their life is that they are not fulfilling their call. They aren't finding what God wants them to do. They aren't pursuing Him to discover what His absolute, perfect will is for their lives. I am personally so hungry to know God's perfect will for my life that I'll do whatever is necessary to attain that goal. I want to know, to the nth degree, what Jesus has called me to do, for what purpose I was born, and what anointings are available to me. So in my search, the question for me was not whether I would offer my body as a living sacrifice. I was too hungry for God to refuse. My question was this, is there a way I can find out how to offer my body as a living sacrifice? If so, somebody please tell me how, and then turn me loose. I want my day in court. If I fail to fulfill my call, don't let it be because you taught me wrong. Don't put me in a holding tank where some powerless doctrine like tongues aren't for today takes away my victory until I have no reward left. Show me how I can walk all the way into God and receive the best God has for me. Just give me my day in court. Then, if I fail, it won't be because someone else took my victory away from me. Well, I kept on searching and studying for the answer to my question. Then one day I discovered I didn't have to look any further than the Apostle Paul and the Book of Romans to find out how to present my body as a living sacrifice. Every condemning sentence canceled. Notice that in Romans 12:1 it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The word therefore means based on what I've already said. In other words, Paul is saying, use the information I taught you in the previous chapters to go on and offer your body so you can find the perfect will of God. Well, we don't have to go back very far to find out where Paul taught us how to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. The eighth chapter holds our answer. Let's start at Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That word, condemnation, is being used in the same way we say a criminal is condemned to die. So Jesus has given me a promise that through Paul's teachings, he has delivered me from every condemning sentence against me, whether of the flesh, the devil, the world, sickness, pain, poverty, or disease. None of these hell-inspired things can be carried out in me anymore. If I meet one condition, I must walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Paul is actually speaking of walking according to the new nature, the reborn human spirit we received when we were born again. The Holy Spirit has been sent to teach our reborn human spirit all truth. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. John 16:13. The Holy Spirit teaches my reborn human spirit that I am no longer under the condemning sentences of sin, sickness, and poverty. I no longer have to walk as an unregenerate man in the flesh. I am to walk after my reborn human spirit as I am taught and led by the Holy Spirit. The devil condemned me to die in my sins so that for all eternity, hell would be my home. But Jesus stepped into my shoes and took my place. He took that condemning sentence unto himself. Now, because Jesus was condemned, I can go free. He was made to be sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 
I was condemned to die under the penalty of every damnable disease known to mankind. But Jesus Christ stepped into my shoes as my substitute. He bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. Matthew 8, 17 Dying under the condemning sentence of my diseases. Now as I... As long as I walk after the Spirit, that condemning sentence can no longer be carried out in me. I was condemned to die in poverty, but Jesus himself, by the grace of God, took the condemning sentences of poverty upon himself. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 Now if I ever learn to walk after the Spirit and not by the dictates of the flesh, that condemning sentence can no longer be carried out in me. So we who are born again have a promise. All condemning sentences by the flesh, the devil, or the world, are canceled if we walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How to walk after the Spirit. That brings me to this question. How do I walk after the Spirit? Paul wouldn't make the statement he did in Romans 8, 1 without going on to tell me how to leave behind the walk of the flesh and begin to walk after the Spirit. In the verses that follow, Paul differentiates between the walk in the Spirit and a walk in the flesh. Notice in verse 13, he says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Don't you wish Paul wasn't so plain about it? But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So now Paul is telling me that to walk after the Spirit, I must somehow mortify or put to death the deeds of the body through the power of my reborn spirit as it is edified and built up by the Holy Spirit. This is starting to sound like Romans 12.1. There it tells me to offer my body as a living sacrifice. But back in Romans 8.13 it tells me that I can't do it through willpower, the energy of the flesh. It has to be through the Spirit. We're going to talk more about mortifying the deeds of the flesh later. For now, the question remains, how do I release the Holy Spirit to edify and build up my reborn human spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh and offer my body as a living sacrifice so I can find God's perfect will for my life? The Holy Spirit helps our infirmities through prayer. To find the answer to that question, skip down to verse 26. Paul is still dividing between a walk of the Spirit and a walk in the flesh. But now he's going to tell us how to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Paul begins with the word likewise. In other words, he is saying, in this manner, or this is how the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities or our weaknesses. The word infirmities refers to our inability to produce results because of the limitations imposed on us by our flesh. So the Holy Spirit was sent to help us in our inability to produ produce results in our own strength. Let me break down the meaning of this verse a little further. Suppose a damnable disease brings normal life to a standstill. I can't get the disease out of my body and it's in the process of killing me. That, my friend, is an infirmity. Or suppose poverty tracks me down and cancels out anything I'm doing for the kingdom of God. It brings my forward progress to a standstill and there doesn't seem to be anything I can do about it. That, too, is an infirmity. But, thank God, the Bible promises that likewise the Spirit helpeth mine infirmities, my inability to produce results because of, because of the limitations imposed on me by the flesh. 
What is your infirmity, your weakness? Is it anger? No love for people? Do you scream at your wife at home? Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit has been sent to help your weaknesses. He's going to show you how to mortify the deeds of the flesh. The Holy Ghost knows how ignorant we are. He knows we don't know how to pray as we ought. He knows we really need to have our soul bypassed when it is being whipped by the devil. So, thank God, he bypasses our soul in the fight the devil wages with it. And he brings an entire language of edification with him. A language so articulate that it makes the English language we speak look like we are playing with linguistic tinker toys. When we pray even just one sentence in tongues, it is for edification, because God is the origin of it. The Holy Ghost can express with one paragraph what would take us all afternoon to say. It is an awesome language, and the Holy Spirit uses it to express not only the mystery of what Christ is in us, but the call of God that we cannot fulfill in our own strength. He steps in with groanings that cannot be uttered and makes intercession for us according to the will of God. So enter into the closet and say, Take over, Holy Ghost. My soul has been sabotaging me lately, but I don't mind spending a day with you. The Mind of the Spirit Now look at verse 27 to see what the Holy Spirit is doing to help us in our infirmities. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Notice it says that the Holy Spirit searches the hearts, plural. That means the Holy Spirit has the power to search the hearts of the entire body of Christ and represent each person before the Father's throne, all at the same time. This ability is what makes him God. As the Holy Spirit goes into my heart to search it, He already knows something very important, the mind of the Spirit. That's why He can make intercession according to the will of God as He searches my heart. For a long time, I searched out that scripture, asking God, what does it mean when it says the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Spirit? I would pack a pile of Greek books in my suitcase and take them on the road with me, searching the scriptures to find out what the mind of the Spirit is, but I couldn't seem to find the answer. Then one day the Lord spoke the revelation to my spirit. I had been praying in tongues all day long, and at the end of the day, he whispered to me the answer to the mystery, taking me back to Romans 8. In Romans 8, 20-21, Paul says that all creation was subjected to corruption at the fall of man in hope of being delivered from bondage to freedom. Paul went on to say that we who have been born again and filled with the Holy Ghost also groan in our spirits, longing for the glorification of our bodies and of the church, verse 23. Paul is talking about God's plan for mankind in these verses a plan that spans the approximately 7,000 years of man's existence on this earth, including the millennium. This is the context in which he talks about the mind of the Spirit in verse 27. But why is the term mind of the Spirit used? Well, God has something different in his mind for each generation born. God's plan of redemption spans 7,000 years, but he who searches the heart's knows what God's mind is for your generation, for your church, and for your life within that great plan. He knows what God called and predestined you to do before the foundation of the world. That is what enables the Holy Spirit to be your representative, your champion, as he makes intercession for you according to the will of God. The Conference Table of God For the sake of our finite minds, let's imagine the conference table of God in eternity's past. At the head of that great conference table sat God the Father. At his right hand sat Jesus Christ, and at his left the Holy Spirit. 
the subject of the conference, the planning of creation. God laid everything out on the table, included in his great plan. He said, we'll create this, and we'll create that, and then we'll create people. Then he started going down through the generations, looking ahead to his plan for each person to be born on this earth. Finally, he reached Dave Roberson's name. God laid out his plan for Dave on the table, from Dave's birth through every great thing he had called him to do to fulfill his calling. Then Jesus, who at the time was known as the mighty Logos, the Word of God, stood up and said, Knowing what will happen at the appointed time, I will go forth and redeem Dave. Next, the Holy Spirit stepped up and said, At the appointed time, I will go forth and baptize Dave's heart. I will also take a supernatural prayer language with me to help Dave pray out the mysteries of God's plan because I was here with the Father when he planned Dave's life from the beginning. God planned not only my life at heaven's great conference table, but your life as well. He planned not only your life, but even the lives of all the female babies of various tribes and peoples who were killed because they were the firstborn and not a male. God had a carefully laid out plan for each one of those little unwanted babies. In fact, there has never been a person born on this earth for whom God neglected to plan his or her life from beginning to end. And who knows God's plan for you? Who better than the Holy Spirit, who was with God the Father when He planned it? And now the Holy Spirit lives within you and searches your heart to find out if you're on the wrong or the right path. Your natural mind can't tell you if you're on the right path. But the Holy Spirit says, If you will release me, I will help your weaknesses and begin to make intercession for you. According to the will of God, I will work God's plan for your life. Nothing can separate you from God's plan. I can't spend six hours praying in the Holy Ghost and worshiping God without the Holy Spirit taking the plan of God, His perfect will for my life, and enforcing it out ahead of me. As I pray, the Holy Ghost will lay hold of and remove every boulder and every mountain that stands in the way of my fulfilling the perfect will of God. And who is a match for the Holy Ghost? That's why Romans 8, 28 goes on to say this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Why will all things now work together for good? Because the Holy Ghost is the one who seizes hold of everything that is contrary to God's will for my life and uses His power to replace it with God's perfect plan. And he does it because I have found out how to release the perfect will of God into my life. Now you can see why Romans 8 ends with such a note of triumph. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 37-39 How can I be so convinced that neither height, nor depth, nor any creature, nor things present, nor things to come, can separate me from God's plan and His love for me? Because I discovered how to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. I found out how to allow the Holy Spirit to walk, work God's plan in my life as I pray much in the Holy Ghost. Yielding your authority to the Holy Spirit. This is where I get excited. In His infinite wisdom, the Holy Ghost knew what to target in order to help us in our infirmities. Certainly, He wasn't going to try to conquer our soul, our mind, our will, our intellect, or our emotions first. Most of us have proven beyond any reasonable doubt that we can be pushed around in those arenas. We get mad at each other. We fall into sin. We live on the edge of carnality. We can't overcome our soul enough to pray as we should. So the Holy Spirit just bypassed all that mess. Our wavering soul, our defeats, our up and down emotional roller coaster rides, our whimpering, 
our swelled speeches of doctrinal error, our lying down in defeat, and our little deceptions. Instead, he went straight into the depths of our spirit, the new creation that contains all the authority Jesus transferred to us. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 18, 19. Then the Holy Spirit said to each of us, Look, little one, you're being whipped because you're puny and weak, and your spirit has no understanding of revelation. But your spirit man does have a new nature, a capacity to understand spiritual matters and the spiritual authority I deposited in you when you were born again. So, excuse me, but I'm here now, and I would like to borrow your authority from you. You see, I need a conqueror, and although I am the all-powerful Holy Spirit, I can't do anything in your life without your authority. First of all, I need your permission and authority to pray through you. Will you give that to me and let me help you fulfill God's perfect will for your life? You see, the Holy Spirit has a handicap. Us. He would have finished taking care of mankind's mess a long time ago if it wasn't for his handicap. He can't even pray through us until we give him that authority. Only when we yield our authority to him will he transfer his supernatural language to our spirit man giving us utterances to pray mysteries before the throne of God. If we are wise, we will lend our authority to the wisest, most powerful being in the universe, the one who moved on the face of the deep and separated the upper and lower firmaments. He who has all that power needs only our authority to operate it in our lives. The moment we start praying in the Holy Ghost, we give heaven the authority to create that prayer in our spirit so we can pray the mind of Christ as we yield our authority to him by praying in the Holy Ghost. We turn him loose to move us into God's perfect will for our lives, watering the seed of God's plan. Don't you wish there was a book of Roberson, a book of, insert your name, that followed the book of Revelation? If there was, I could look up the chapter that represented the particular year I was living. Let me see. This is the 53rd year of my life. So I'll turn to the 53rd chapter. Look here. I'm supposed to go to this city and preach at this church next month. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father, for the book of Roberson that has your plan for my life in it. There is no such book in the Bible. But such a book does exist. The moment you were born again and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within you, that book was deposited on the inside of your spirit. That book is God's perfect will for your life in seed form. On the inside of that seed is the DNA programming for God's entire plan for you. And if you'll yield to the Holy Spirit, He will bring forth its contents, causing it to grow into a strong, deeply rooted tree of blessing and divine purpose. He will continually work God's plan, searching your heart moment by moment, and praying the will of God for your life way out ahead of you. You see, the leadership of the Holy Spirit is not a whim or a passing thought. When you're following His direction, your life will not be like this. Oh, I think God wants me to go to that city tomorrow. Then the next day, oh, I'm not sure whether or not he wants me to go. And the following day, oh, I think he really does want me to go. The Holy Spirit doesn't run things the way a natural man does. He doesn't play with your life. He is out for your success. But you have to cooperate with him by allowing him to pray through you. When Jesus said that out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, John 7 38 he was speaking of the Holy Ghost so the more you pray in the Holy Ghost the more you water the seed that contains God's plan as you continue to pray and sow to the Spirit you will eventually reap from the Spirit 
for the seed will sprout and grow into the will and the direction of God for your life. The more the seed grows, the more prevalent God's plan will become. As you continue to walk after the Spirit, that divine direction will become so strong in your life that it will be almost impossible for you to walk in the wrong direction. God's direction will no longer be hard to catch. It will be hard to miss. You will literally have to get past God's will to fail. God's wisdom and guidance will gradually consume and overtake you until the voice of the Holy Spirit becomes louder than the enemy who surrounds you with adverse circumstances and proclaims you are going to fail. And at every level of God's plan that you attain, the anointing of His Spirit will be there to give you the grace to fulfill His perfect will. I'm telling you, the devil is so afraid that you're going to get a hold of this message and run with it. I don't think you have any idea how afraid the devil is of prayer. You see, he knows he has only one chance to keep you from fulfilling the purpose you were born to fulfill. He has to get you out of prayer so that you stop allowing the Holy Spirit to work God's plan for you. Other than that strategy, the devil doesn't have a chance because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4 Well done. So why is it so vitally important that you learn how to release the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to walk in God's perfect will? Because just as sure as you breathe, at the appointed moment in God's time scale that all creation has longed for, Jesus will split the eastern sky at the sound of a great trumpet. On that day, when you behold Jesus face to face, what will he say to you? Will you be able to stand there knowing that you ch chose to believe in God enough to abandon your life to Him while it still made a difference? If so, you will hear the words, You did a job well done, my good and faithful servant. I am trying to help you understand the value of the Lamb's reward for fulfilling your call. On the day you stand before the Master, you will trade everything you possess for just one nod of approval. One look from his eyes that says, Well done. You will trade it all to know that he who he knows the hell you went through to give your whole life to your call. He sees the multitude you took home to heaven with you. Nothing can replace that reward. Someone may say, But I don't have time to pray. Of course you don't because you've never taken your Holy Ghost calculator and calculated what your lack of prayer has cost your character and your life. If you ever did, you'd say instead, I don't have time not to pray. Whatever you're not doing, you're not doing it because you don't want to. If you aren't praying as you should, the reason is simple. You don't want to. Well, I have a career. I don't have time to pray that much. But you are in that situation because it is what you chose. Can I have a career and a strong prayer life as well? You don't know what a career is until you release the Holy Spirit to help you fulfill it by His power. You have a call. No one else has it. God would have to arrange something else for the body of Christ if you failed to find and fulfill what God has called you to do. But you, you can find your divine call. You're still on this earth. You're still breathing. You still have the opportunity to release the Holy Spirit in prayer to help you find and fulfill God's perfect will for your life. Are you going to let your lazy flesh cheat you out of hearing those words, well done? I don't think so.